second, I just want to. Ah, maybe I open it in PowerPoint, then we will have a bit better quality of the slides. Oh, wait a second. Okay, then we can see a bit better what happens. Um, so, okay. And maybe even the movies will work. That's, that's pretty fine. Okay, can you see my slides? No. no. Or wait a second. Can you now see the screen, Mr. Schröder? Yes, I can see you. Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So I would say let's start the recording. We start the lectures and okay. So Mr. Schröder, start. Okay, so hello again. Here is the second chapter of our lectures, Fluid Energy Machines. And the chapter is Combustion Engines, part one. Um, what is, at first I want to present you the slide I always present. Um, we will to have a look at fluid energy machines in general. And we can divide the machines in power machines and work machines. Power machines can be water turbines, steam and gas turbines, or even windmills, wind turbines. Work machines are compressors, ventilators, or pumps. A power machine, in a power machine, you always have a fluid, and the fluid flows. Uh, through the machine and will give us energy back. Work machine is totally different. They always look a bit the same, but they are totally different because in a work machine you spend energy, electric energy or mechanical energy, and then you will, with this energy, you will drive a compressor or ventilator or a pump, and then you will move a fluid with it. Yeah, So it's vice versa compared to a power machine. And now have a bit closer look. We have the chapter combustion engine and the combustion engine is a power machine and it's really similar to a steam or gas turbine. Yeah? Uh, in a gas turbine you burn the gas, you burn the oil or the fuel, um, maybe in an airplane, and then you produce a steam and a, a, a jet. For example, combustion engine is similar principle, but in the combustion engine you have a piston, a moving rod, and in the gas turbine you have a rotating part, so turbine, for example. Okay, so let's have a short look at the history of combustion engines. Combustion engines are used for over nearly 150 years, or let's say over 200 years, and the first really working um, combustion engine was not built for cars. It was built by Nicholas Otto and the company Deutz, and it was built for pumping and, and for ventilation and um, of mines and for pumping water and for industry purpose. And in 80, um, in 1886, um, Gottlieb Daimler came to the idea to use the combustion engine for here for um, build up the first car. Okay, and have an additional look. Um, after Daimler and um, Benz built their first car, there was a dramatic boom in combustion engine. Um, maybe I can mention in these times there were also electric cars. For example, in 1900, um, Porsche 
built his first car and it was an electric car. And they had a lot of different cars in this time. They even have had cars that were uh, that used ammoniac for um, energy production. But really fast, the combustion engine um, was developed more and more and was more or less the winner of the game. Um, I also want to mention a really big and good factory. It's called Bosch in Stuttgart, Robert Bosch GmbH. I told you I worked for a long time, for over 12 years, in the um, development of diesel engines in the Robert Bosch GmbH. And uh, Bosch was one of the first um, person who invented um, mechanical parts and electric parts for cars. Um, um, Robert Bosch was really an interesting person. You can see him here. As a young man, as a young, really young student, he moved to from Stuttgart to America for two years and worked um, similar to your situation. Yeah, Normally, you're an Erasmus student, you go to another country, you learn something, and Robert Bosch did totally the same. He went for two years uh, to America, to the Wild West, and he, he, it was, I think it was a really interesting time for him. And then he came back and then he started his small company where he built Dutch, um, yeah, ignition systems or oilers or even spark plugs was really famous invention from Robert Bosch. And Daimler and Benz, they also built a lot of machines and they even Build uh, piston engines for airplanes. Um, by the way, airplanes uh, use the, the normally uh, today we have a lot of uh, turbochargers for combustion engines, and also the turbocharger was invented for airplanes because if the airplanes fly into high altitude. Um, the air gets thinner and then you have to compress the air to get the same combustion process. So we will come to turbocharging a bit later. Let's have a look at a modern car. This is a really nice car. It's a Ferrari Tipo. And um, I present you this picture because this was a customer of mine when I was for a long time in Turkey where I built it direct injection nozzles for direct injection gasoline combustion. And that was one of our customer. And it was a really nice car. We built the engine. And what is important, if you look at this type of car, of course, it has to be, yeah, in the, um, yeah, you have to take care about a lot of things. But if you look at this car, most important is that you can drive it fast. Yeah, I think all the customers want to use the engine. They want to have a good engine, high quality product. And here this car can reach 100 kilometers per hour in three seconds, 200 in 8.3 seconds, and has a top speed of 330 kilometers per hour. So we speak a lot about environment, of course, about sustainability, but I think we should also look at what we already reach, what we already did. And we must say combustion engine is really a really good product nowadays. Uh, it's not something that we should skip. Okay, that was a bit, bit about my work at Bosch. So um, I want to present this to you because you all uh, participate to this lecture because after your lecture, of course, you want to go to company, you want to do a good job. And that was something uh, really engineering work, something from daily life of an engineer. Yeah? We made this small program, so you also need simulation, you need programming, you have to do your, your program, your own tools if you finish. Here this was a, a spreadsheet we made for 
combustion nozzles and you can see a bit here as a diagram so we even used vector mathematics and then here is a combustion process ah yeah it will not work i know this normally you can see the combustion process here but we always have the problem if we look at it here over um, Moodle, it can happen that the movies will not work, but doesn't matter. I will show you some pictures later. And then we, um, after the design of the combustion process, so first, how do engineers work? They first make a design, they make calculation, they make combustion calculation, they make design of the combustion, then they make the construction of the piston, they make the construction of the valves, of the nozzles, of the plugs, and afterwards they add it to customers' engines. Okay, that's the way. And I think this movie will also not work. Doesn't matter. Um, maybe I show you this movie after our recording. I know we have always a bit trouble if we show a movie and record it. Meanwhile, this can cause problems. Okay, no problem. This is also the same. Movies will not work, but doesn't matter. We skip it and we come to the more important parts of this lecture. Um, before we understand the combustion engine, before we understand what a piston engine, um, how a piston engine works, we have to repeat a bit the theory. You all had thermodynamics in school or thermodynamics in university. You, you are master students, you already know what thermodynamics is, but I want to repeat a bit theory here. And first important, most important law is the ideal gas law. You can see the ideal gas law here. We have pressure, we have volume, we have mass, we have the gas constant and temperature. And if you now look back into this piston here in this picture, here we have the volume of our piston. And what happens now if we, for example, change the volume, if we compress the gas, the pressure, the, if the volume gets smaller, the pressure has to get bigger to fulfill the equation. Or for example, if you start the combustion here, if we rise up the temperature, what will happen? The volume will get bigger or the pressure will get bigger and we can produce work with our engine. That's um, so um, to describe the process, the combustion process in the cylinder, we need this ideal gas law. So, I, and I always tell you, um, you should learn for the exam, of course, you should try to solve um, our exercises here and um, please make a cross here at the ideal gas law. I think that's the most important law if you want to learn something about combustion engine. Okay, with this ideal gas law, we can also calculate the reference air mass we need in the cylinder. Yeah. Or so if you want to design the engine, for example, of a Ferrari Tipo, we must calculate the air mass and we must also calculate the volume of the cylinder. We must know if we need a cylinder with, with one liter or a cylinder with two liter. Or for example, if you want to build up a big ship, we need really high volume of the cylinder. Um, okay, so based on this ideal gas law, we can also calculate the mass of air inside the cylinder and based on this air inside the cylinder we can calculate the so-called lambda value so volume efficiency and the relative air charge lambda value is really important mm. 
Maybe you know lambda measurement from the exhaust gas system of an engine. Lambda value means how much air we need to fulfill our combustion. I want to explain this a bit more in detail later. Here's also an additional important law. It's um, the law of Bernoulli. And this is also a law we need to describe engines. Yeah. Um, you know it also from other lectures, maybe, but it's important if we have, for example, a common rail system, a diesel common rail system, and we have a high pressure inside the rail or inside the pump, and then we want to do the combustion and for the combustion, for the injection of the fuel or for the injection of the gasoline into the cylinder, we need to know how high the velocity of the fuel will be. So, for example, if we have a diesel engine, we have up to 2000 or 2500 bars inside our rail, and we have a really small hole in the nozzle in the valve and we inject the gasoline into the valve and then we will have a really high velocity afterwards. So this law is not new, it was yeah, not invented, it was more or less discovered by Mr. Bernoulli in, yeah, in the 18th century. The next important value where you can make or the next important equation where you can make your cross you will need it yeah really often here is the so-called compression ratio what is a compression ratio in the compression ratio you compare the volume of the cylinder by the compressed volume of the cylinder. So if you, hmm, let's go big back to the slides I showed you before. Ah, I will have some better picture. For here you can see it really good. You have your volume of your cylinder. Yeah. And if it's yeah, if you push out the, the rod. If you have a big volume, maybe one liter or one liter is, is a lot, yeah, or, or half a liter, um, then and then if you push the rod into the cylinder, you will compress your volume. Your pressure will rise inside this chamber, but you will not compress it totally. Here you can see there are valves at the top. There is a spark plug, there is a nozzle and the valve for gasoline. And you can imagine if you compress it totally, you will damage the plug. You will damage here this, this valve, you will damage the injector. Yeah? So you can't compress it totally. And this is what the, this number, the compression volume tells you. With the compression ratio, you can also calculate the efficiency uh, together with isentrophic exponent. And you have characteristic compression values for different engines. For example, for auto engines, for gas engines, you have a bit lower compression ratio. It's about 7 to 10. And with the diesel engine, you have a much higher compression ratio. That means diesel engines are more efficient. As higher as the compression ratio is, as higher is the efficiency. Yeah? So please take this into account. This is also make your cross here. This is always something I can ask in the exams. Yeah? That's a hot candidate. Okay, let's have a look at efficiency in detail. 
you have for your whole engine, for your whole combustion engine, you have a total overall efficiency. And um, this, this total overall efficiency can be influenced by different single small efficiency. For example, efficiency for mechanical degree of efficiency. Um, this describes you the friction of the bearings, the gears, all the ceilings, uh, or if you have some chains, um, all these mechanical parts have friction. So you will have a mechanical efficiency. On the other side, you can have a so-called volumetic degree of efficiency. And this will take into account the loses in the gas. Yeah? For example, if you have turbulence or for example, um, your compression ratio. This, all this volumetic combustion um, problems will lower your volumetric degree of efficiency, even dissipation of gas. Yeah? And yeah, this comes, uh, there we come to the inner degree of efficiency. You will always have, also have a friction inside the fluid. Yeah. And this will also lower our overall efficiency. And if you want to calculate the total efficiency, you have to multiply all the single efficiencies. So for example, if you have here an efficiency of 0 0.8, you have here efficiency of 0 0.7, and here efficiency of 0 0.4, you have to multiply them, and then you will get your total overall efficiency. OK. We will have some examples. We will calculate some examples about it. Here we can see some typical modern combustion engines. For example, we have here this direct injected TSI engine from Volkswagen. It's a really modern, it's a small engine. This is also the trend in combustion engines. They get smaller and smaller. We only have three cylinders here. And on the other side, you can see a really big engine. That's a commercial vehicle engine. And yeah, what I want to mention here, um, I tell you a lot about fluid energy machines in this uh, lecture. And here you can see also a fan. Yeah? That's something from chapter one. A fan is also always part of an engine. Yeah? So if you look back at our first chapter, um, you see an engine is built from different parts, from electric machines. You need turbochargers, you need pistons, and you need also fans. And here you can see a bit more. This is not only the engine of the MAN, it's also the whole powertrain. So powertrain means we have here our gear, we have the axis, we have even some wheels or brakes here. This also are parts of the powertrain. And what you can also see, we can have small engines and we can have big engines. And all the parts you can see here have to fit to the engine. So an engineer has to design all the single parts and you can't take the parts from the MAN engine and put it onto the um, Volkswagen engine. Yeah? You have to design for all the engines different parts in different sizes. Okay, let's have a short look at lambda value, at the combustion air ratio. Uh, here you can imagine you to to get power out of the engine you have to spend of course gasoline or to get power out of this engine you have to spend some diesel so you need chemical energy but how much fuel do we need yeah for example if we have one kilogram of gasoline here um, you can directly calculate the power you get from this amount of fuel and you can also calculate the air you need yeah 
you need a lot of air to burn this gasoline. To burn this gasoline, one kilogram, we need about 14.5 kilograms of air. Why do we need so much air to burn one kilogram of gasoline? Because of the chemistry of the stoichiometric combustion. This is CXHY. It's a, it's a lumping component for gasoline. And if we have this amount of hydrocarbon, we have to add um, a defined amount of oxygen to combust it, to produce water and carbon dioxide from it. And yeah, you see, we need much more air than gasoline. And I, um, yeah, if you imagine how much, um, yeah, how much air it can be, yeah, the, the density of air is about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So we need about, around about 10 cubic meters of air to burn one kilogram of gasoline. So you can imagine we need a lot of turbochargers, we need a lot of fans to get access to this high amount of air. Um, what does the lambda value tell us? Yeah, the lambda value tell us the amount of air we need we really need compared to the minimum amount of air. Yeah, the, the real air mass is always or should be always a bit higher than the stoichiometric air mass because you will also have a mixing process. You, would, you can never, um, um, yeah, you can never um, drive an engine with lambda values below one because then you do not fulfill chemistry, you have a really fat mixture and you will produce a lot of sous and carbon in your exhaust hose. It will be a, a really dirty combustion, yeah, this caused by this fat, fat mixture. And so we always want to have higher lambda values, yeah. If we have, for example, 1.5, lambda 1.5, we have 50% additional air, 50% more air than we really need. Hmm. So I can tell you higher number, higher lambda numbers are always better for the engines. Yeah, A higher lambda number is always better for emissions. You have a cleaner combustion, but higher lambda values also need higher prices of the engine because you have to pay it. You have to pay for turbocharger, you have to pay for fans, or you have to pay for a higher, en uh, a bigger engine, a, bit, a bigger um, volume of the cylinders. Yeah? Okay, this is, uh, it's unfortunately in German, and I think this um, is about exhaust gas recirculation, I can, I think I should skip the slide a bit. And here is again the combustion process. I told you we have two main combustion engines. We have a gas engine, a gasoline engine. Gasoline engines can also be driven with natural gas. Yeah, we're not uh, only, uh, it's not mandatory that we use gasoline, we can also normally use methane gas for this combustion process. And in a gasoline engine, the combustion process is totally different than if we compare it with a diesel engine. Um, in a gasoline engine, we have, we inject the fuel, yeah, before we mix the fuel and we inject it into the air and then the cylinder is filled with this air gasoline mixture and then we have our spark plug. We ignite this um, atmosphere and then we get la like a small explosion. Yeah, we, we get here this explosion inside the cylinder 
and this will rise up our temperature, this will rise up our pressure, and then we can get the work from our engine. If we now look at the diesel engine, the, 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 you, you maybe know it from daily life, you can never use gasoline in a diesel engine, or you can never use um, diesel in a gasoline engine. Diesel is a totally different chemical substance. Diesel, diesel is an oil. Yeah? You can even use biodiesel or bio oil, or you can use, um, yeah, it's a totally different substance. And the combustion process is also totally different. The, the biggest difference is you don't have a spark plug. Yeah, that's that's always if someone tells you you need a spark plug in a diesel engine, you know he, he didn't know anything about engines. Yeah. In a gasoline engine, we have a spark plug. In a diesel engine, we do not have spark plugs. Yeah. And diesel um combustion will take place with very high pressures. Yeah, the pressures are much higher than in the gasoline engine and the spray, the, the oil will be injected in droplets. So we have a lot of small droplets that are injected into the chamber and then we rise up the pressure and this will cause a self-ignition, an auto-ignition of this atmosphere. So um, the combustion will take place, Yeah, it will be ignited only by um, rise of pressure and rise of temperature. Um, this combustion is much more efficient, much better, and we can use much better lambda values. We can use much higher lambda values. So this is a much more efficient process. Um, of course, we had some problems in the last years with um, with um, nitrogen dioxide. I will explain this problem a bit later. We have, of course, SUS problems and noise problems. Um, in gasoline engines, we had knocking problems. And I have made some calculations about this uh, nitrogen um, dioxide problem. I will explain it a bit in detail and maybe hopefully you can understand it a bit better afterwards. So ha have a look at our spark plug. Here we have some spark plugs and you learned, you already learned, these spark plugs can only be used for gasoline engines. You never have a spark plug in a diesel engine. Diesel engines don't need spark plug in ignition. You have, yeah, it's unfortunately in German and it's, yeah, it's also not so important. We have different types of spark plugs, but more or less the principle is important. We have an atmosphere, a mixture of air and gasoline. And in this mixture, we have a small spark an electric spark and this spark ignites our combustion and we can have different spark types. Um, I show you this picture to uh, give you a bit of expression, impression how much work has to be spent to make the design of the spark plugs. We have many, many different types of spark plugs. Okay. Here is another picture of our cylinder. It's much better. It's just a painted picture. And it's also a picture from my uh, time at Bosch. We have here our cylinder. We have our piston. Piston will be moved upwards and downwards. Here we see the, um, the valve. Yeah? The valve, the injection of the gasoline will come from here and ah you see it's not a direct injection engine yeah here this is a the injection will take place in the manifold this is a bit older design we have a lot of sensors here and we have a lot of pumps and we have also the exhaust gas system and here you can see 
äh, the Lambda Sensor. Ja? So the Lambda Sensor, I explained you what the Lambda Sensor is. Lambda will be also measured in the engine. So if our engine does not fulfill this demand, yeah, if, if, if Lambda is not fulfilled here, our engine will change it. Yeah? It will be done directly by our ECU and will change the combustion process. Okay, have a bit look at thermodynamics at the theory. Um, we need to do a bit thermodynamics here in this lecture, otherwise you will not understand the combustion engine in total. And the ideal diagram to describe it is a pressure volume diagram. In thermodynamics, we always use temperature entropy diagrams or pressure volume diagrams. Hopefully you, you remember it, you remember your lectures about thermodynamics and I want to repeat it a bit. We have, we start here at number one. We put the rod into the cylinder and first we compress our gas. Yeah, we compress our mixture of gas and then here at this point, this point the combustion will occur. And now yeah, this is the ideal process. I will show you also the realistic process. Normally this line is a bit rounder. The combustion process will also rise the pressure. It will rise the volume a bit. And then we have a higher pressure because of combustion, because of temperature rise. And then we can deliver the work with the rod. And then this circle process will start again. Okay, here we see also this process again. And this is a process of a, no, of a modern four-stroke four spark ignited engine. We also know two-stroke spark ignited engines, but they are a bit older. Yeah? Uh, we had it in the Trabi or in a, in, in a small motorbike or, or ship engine. We have two-stroke um, engines. Normally, every today, every car or every modern car works with this two-stroke spark ignited engine cycle. And in a two-stroke, uh, by the way, this was always when when someone new came, new persons uh, came to to Bosch and we made an interview. This was a classic question in this interview. In this. Um, to ask them if they know something about engines. So even you as a, as a, you sh I, I think if you are an engineer later, if you are a master, you should know this process a bit. Okay, how does it work? We move the rod, we move the rod downwards and we inject the air here at the intake valve. Then at the second stroke, Combustion, um, yeah, compression of course. Yeah, we will here we will rotate this axis. We will rise up the piston. Compression will occur. And remember the ideal gas law. Yeah, here go back to ideal gas law. Here, yeah, remember this law. If I rise up the piston. I rise up the piston here, the pressure will be higher. It will be, yeah, here it will be about one bar. It will come from outside of the car. It will be about one bar. And here it will be about 40 to 50 bar. And now we have our mixture with 40, 50 bar. We have our atmosphere. We have gasoline and air inside this chamber. And then we will ignite it with the spark plug and because of this ignition, the piston will move downward and we get the work. From it. And then there will be also a fourth stroke. Yeah, We need this stroke because 
we have to clean the cylinder afterwards. This combusted air, this, this air, um, there is also emission, but there's carbon dioxide, there's water inside this chamber and we have to clean it and then the process can start again and the air can be sucked inside again. Okay, go a bit faster here. This is, there you can see the crank angles. Um, we have crank angle will go from zero to 360 and we have high pressures here, pressure about 40, 50 bar. We have ignition and we have cleaning processes with about one bar. Here is again the PV diagram for the silica process, but it is not the ideal diagram. Yeah, here I showed you the ideal diagram. Yeah, it's a bit more edgy. Here, this is a more realistic curve. Here again, we see the compression in the cylinder. Ignition occurs. Yeah, the spark plug will ignite. The explosion will compor, uh, occur. We have combustion. Then we get even a much higher pressure. Yeah, we will rise up the pressure with about four or five bars. And then we can use the delivered work in our combustion engine again. And this here is a cleaning process. Here we clean the cylinder again. And the work and the power can be calculated by the area under this curve. Of course, cleaning process uh, will do not give us any kind of work. So how can we clean the cylinder if we don't get work here? Yeah, it will be cleaned by another cylinder. So we in a combustion engine, we always have yeah, four or five cylinders, or we can even have 12 cylinders. As more cylinder, if we have more cylinders, we can make this cleaning process more efficient. Yeah, so we always need another cylinder to clean our cylinder. Yeah, if, if, if we have a working process, we can use the power, but for the cleaning process, we need another cylinder. Okay. So this is a small picture about the two spark, two stroke spark engine. And um, I will explain it to you, but um, I think you will not need it anymore because these engines are not really used anymore. Um, we had a really famous car here in Germany called the Trabant, yeah, Trabi, uh, and the Trabi had a two stroke engine. Or for example, if you have small motorbikes, motorbikes always have two stroke and or, or had in, in, in the past had two stroke engines. Today, they also have four stroke engines. And but the two stroke engine is really interesting and it's a really clever concept. Yeah, it's even a bit more clever than the four stroke engine because in the two stroke engine, you have your combustion process, uh, you have your compression process here, you are compress your fluid, you ignite it, and your cleaning process is done in stroke one. Yeah. So if you, in, in the two-stroke engine, you, if you produce a high pressure here, you will push down the rod again. Yeah. And now if you push down the rod, here's an intake air valve. The intake air valve is closed. If you push down the rod, you get a compression here um, below the cylinder. And then you can use um, the compressed air here for cleaning. So in the four stroke engine, if you look back, you do not use the pressure here in this chamber. Yeah, If you get here, if the rod moves downward, you get a compression here, but you do not use this pressure. Yeah? And here you use the pressure below the piston to clean the rod. That's a bit clever, yeah, but it's also 
bit difficult to do it. Yeah, it's 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 um, uh, if you remember this kind of engines, they produce a lot of emissions because it's really difficult to to manage this. Okay, here is a um, Seiliger process, the PV diagram of a two-stroke engine. So you don't have cylinder cleaning here, and you have compression, ignition, and work delivery. And you simply have outflow yeah, of the gas. Okay, so it's much more easy process. It is a process from the past. I think there will not be a lot of engines in future that uses two-stroke spark ignition process. Okay, so let's summarize it a bit. We need thermodynamics. We need um, to to understand the process. We need PV diagram. We will have a lot of formulas here to explain it. And we have ideal processes. Here you can see really ideal processes, but in reality, the processes look much different than this ideal processes. Okay. Oh. Okay. Ah, oh, there's a lot written here. You can read the slides, but in general, most important part is you have ideal processes, you have realistic processes, and of course you have a lot of losers. Yeah? That's always in life. You never have, uh, every, not all things are ideal. Yeah? In reality, you always have losers. Okay. Yeah, there are some additional formulas. Yeah? You need, for example, to calculate the power of the engine. To calculate the power, we need yeah, the mass flow. So if you look at this mass flow, you calculate the power from the mass flow of media, of air. Though this is also explanation why we have, if we have higher mass flows, yeah, we need bigger cylinders. Though if we need engines that spend a lot of energy, for example, for ships or so. When I, uh, last time when I went to Finland, I saw, I, I went with a ferry to Finland from Travemünde to Helsinki, and there I saw a lot of really big ship engines, yeah, and you need high volumes to get high powers, and if you want to get smaller powers from this engine, you need smaller mass flows. Um, there's another possibility to calculate the power from um, a combustion engine. You can also use the momentum of here of the torque. Yeah, momentum of torque. And if you know the number of revolutions here of your crank, then you can calculate also the power. No, you multiply it with two with p. This is the number of rotations and the momentum, and this gives you your power. And based on this, you can also calculate the power of your engines by the pressure, the volume of your piston, and the speed. Yeah, here by 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 by, uh, by this n variable, and this n variable is different if you use four-stroke engines or two-stroke engines. Because in the four-stroke engines, you have always a cleaning cycle. Yeah, this I, I explained to you that you need to clean your engine, and this will cost you some, uh, let's say, power. So um, in here, the power of a four-stroke engines, if you have the volume of your of your cylinder, you will only have half of the power because every second um, cycle will be used for cleaning. Yeah? In the two-stroke engine, you do not need this because you can use every stroke of the engine to get power from the engine. Yeah? Okay. 
here you can have also yes again you can calculate the power also by the mass flow of the fuel you can use the, the mass flow of process air or you can use the mass flow of fuel because both mass flows must fit together to fulfill your lambda value uh, you can use both for calculation of the power and you can also calculate your efficiency of the engine if you know the real power and divide it by the ideal power and here this this ideal power is be calculated by the chemical energy you spend. Chemical energy can be calculated by the mass flow of fuel. Now, for example, if you know you, you burn one kilogram of gasoline, then you must know your heating value. This is the heating value. This gives you the energy that is stored in your fuel. As a heating value is, for example, joule per kilogram you multiply it with a mass flow and then you get your ideal um, energy the, the total overall energy you can spend in this process of course um, efficiency will be never one you, know, you, you will always have loses in engines okay here the another formula you will need now it's the same, more or less the same <coughs> than in the last slide. You can calculate your e efficiency. And in former times, the efficiency was also called the horsepower. Um, maybe um, in, in older, uh, in former days, we called it horsepower. Yeah, though it, we compare the car with a horse, and if the car had the same energy, then 500 horses, uh, we called it horsepower 500. Okay. Then, yeah, uh, again, delivery rate, I think I already explained it. And also, if you want to calculate this delivery rate, you have to take into account if you have a two stroke cycle engine or four stroke cycle engine because remember what i told you if you have a four stroke engine you only you can use every second stroke yeah so you can only use half of the volume of the cylinder because um every second stroke you need work for cleaning okay then we have another quantity that is important for combustion engine, the so-called effective mean pressure. What is the effective mean pressure? I tried to explain it a bit simply. Fight, yeah. If you lose, if, if you look back here in in our PW diagram, you see during the combustion process we have different pressures, yeah. How can you influence this curve? You can influence the, this, this diagram with your foot. If you step on the gas pedal of your car, and if you step only a little bit on your gas pedal, you only get small curve. If you step really hard on your gas pedal, if you drive 200 kilometers per hour, you have high a higher pressure and so uh, in combustion science this is difficult to explain it in words yeah this uh, this range of pressure so we make it a bit more simple we just calculate one constant pressure that is characteristic for your driving in this moment yeah though we we do not talk about this curve here we just calculate one pressure in the middle and this is a mean pressure here go back to the slide now this is the effective mean pressure so this is a simplified a simplified explanation of the silica process in the p v diagram that's how we can explain it 
OK. And. Yeah, let's have a short system overview. I already showed you this slide. This is again a, a slide from Bosch. Here we have our combustion process. I explained it already, but we even need some more parts. We need, for example, a tank for the fuel. We need a fuel pump here in the tank. We need here, for example, the air mass meter. We have need an air throttle, so we have to control the air. And we need also a central processing unit, a ECU. It's a small computer to control all the parts. And of course, this is for you the most important part. If you drive your car, we need the gas pedal. And the gas pedal, if you put with the foot on the gas pedal, the signal will go to our ECU and then it will control the whole engine. Yeah. OK, that's more or less a simplified explanation of the whole gasoline engine. Let's have a short look into history. Where did we use this combustion engines? Um, uh, now you would say, huh, in 10 years we all have electric cars. Uh, combustion engines are not important anymore, but I would say um, combustion engines will be also important in the future. Uh, I would, I, uh, I have a bit different opinion, and of course, you can also need combustion engines not only for cars. You can use it for many other um, um, important topics. For example, for energy, for uh, we call it German Blockheizkraftwerk, yeah, for um, electric purposes or for ships or for uh, for vans, for example. Yeah, we will. I think we will. Uh, the not uh, the the combustion engine is not already dead, in my opinion. Okay, we here we have some cars. Yeah, some some cars disappeared. For example, the good port was also a really nice car, a really modern car, but it disappeared. Um, then we have here, for example, even a really nice car from 1954, and it already used ECUs. Uh, it, it, it had an electronic processing unit. Or, for example, here this car is a good example for gasoline direct injection. And here are some more cars. Yeah? They are not so modern, but they are also nice cars, and they were. Um, really in their times, they were really um, had really big advantages compared to other cars. Uh, this was one of the first car with a Chetronic, or even this Porsche is, is a classic car. It's you can still buy this 911 uh, in the in a really similar design. Or here you see other cars with combustion engines and um, modern control units. OK, there is, of course, some literature. And there is, of course, a lot of literature, a lot. And um, I always also want to tell you there's another really good book, a fantastic book. And I want to show you this new book. Um, if you go to Amazon and you can search for with my name, we have written our own book about, now it's not about combustion engine, but it's about how to use Amazon. So unfortunately, it's in German. Um, to all our Finnish colleagues and Finnish students, it's, you can't, um, it's difficult to read it, but for all our German-speaking students, if you are interested in simulation of engines, if you're interested in this kind of system simulation, you can just order it and use it, and it is also an introduction for our Amazon. Okay, so Mr. Schröder, I think that's enough for today. You can stop the movie and